Every visionary has a story to tell. These stories educate and inspire us all. You could hear them cranking up in the morning and hear the click, click, click of the roller coaster. It's really feeling satisfied and feeling gratified with bringing happiness to young children, especially families. Working with people who are having a good time is so much better than any other job. Join us as we learn from these trailblazers. I went looking for a job and someone suggested I go to Marriott Corporation. But they were just beginning to get in the amusement park business and they needed an attorney to uh, do some of the work in connection with that undertaking. So they hired me and I was assigned to the amusement park projects. They were going to build three parks originally, one in Santa Clara, one in Gurney, Illinois, both of which got built. But the third park, which was really the only one that Mr. Marriott wanted in his backyard, was scheduled for the Washington, D.C. area, and they never got it built for a, a number of reasons. Then they decided to get out of the business, and I was enjoying it so much that I uh, had an opportunity to get into the association as, uh, well, first their counsel, uh, but with the understanding that I'd move up shortly to the, uh, well, it was then the executive director's position, later president and CEO. But the first thing that I had to do was to develop a contract for the purchase of rides. Uh, this was going to be three parks and a tremendous expenditure of money for Marriott Corporation. Uh, so they were very concerned that, that they'd cross all the T's and dot all the I's in this thing. The man that they had hired as uh, head of the th uh, theme park division, David Brown, uh, called me over one day to talk about purchasing the rides for these parks. And I told him the we would have to develop a contract. He said, well, nobody in this industry really goes by contracts. He says, there's this great big show that's held every year. He didn't even tell me what the name of it was. This great big show is held every year, and he said people will go there, and, and they find what it is they need to buy, and they shake hands, and some months later the ride is delivered, and they pay for it. And I said, well, I don't think that the legal department's going to be content with that kind of an operation, so we'll have to draw up a a contract. So I drew up a contract for him. The first man to come along to sell David some rides was a man by the name of um, Mac Deuce. And he came in with piles of books of, of rides. And, we, and David said to him, John's here because uh, the company needs contracts for the purchase of these rides. And that kind of startled him. His eyebrows raised and he said, well, we don't usually do that way. And David said, well, I know, but under the circumstances, given the, invol the involvement here that we're getting into with money and so on, they, they need to have it. So he said, that's fine. He said, why don't we start out? And he said, you can tell me what the requirements of your contract are as we go along. So Max started selling these rides, and uh, every once in a while I'd say, well, now we'll need to have a warranty. Uh, that it were. Well, he said, there are no warranties in this business. He said, just everybody trusts everybody. I said, well, I'm sorry, we'll have to have a warranty. And it kind of went on this way for, for a couple of hours. And finally, Mac uh, just very politely closed his book and he said, you know, I think it would be best if I kept my rides and you kept your contract. And he got up and walked out. <laughs> but we held our ground and, and uh, the general counsel insisted that we would have to do these, uh, do these contracts. So I have been blamed for being the person who introduced uh, the contract to most of the industry. The association then didn't have a huge legislative agenda. There were a couple of issues. They had gotten an exemption from the minimum wage laws uh, way back in the late 1930s, and uh, it was very important to them to protect that, that exemption. We got into uh, the matter of ride safety, and there were people in Congress who were pushing to get uh, federal jurisdiction over the parks uh, with respect to matters of safety, put it in the Consumer Product Safety Commission really didn't apply very well to something like an amusement ride, which was intended to produce thrills for people, and people taking a certain risk when they get on. But um, every 
every, well, almost every year that would come up in Congress. Well, I think when I took over, there was something like 637 members in the association. It was uh, international in form anyhow, but uh, had very few members outside the United States. But it really was not in any real sense an international association. And we felt it was important to get a one body that would uh, develop standards, develop programs and so on for the industry worldwide. Well, shortly after I took over, we, uh, we uh, had what, uh, the first strategic planning session that had ever been held that um, stressed particularly the things I just mentioned, membership development and particularly a genuine representation for the international parks, uh, bringing them into the, the um, organization structurally and leadership positions and so on. Um, we got a lot more involved in educational programs, developing educational materials and conducting educational programs both in this country and overseas for, for member parks in other countries. The focus initially was almost entirely in Europe. We didn't look much to South America or to Asia, mainly because we just had no history of relationships with any of the people in those areas. But that soon followed. We went to a, a trade show in China. We didn't participate in that show as far as taking any uh, exhibitors along because I was uh, absolutely convinced it couldn't be a successful show. I'd never heard of any parks in China. I thought if they had 10 parks and each one of them sent six people, there'd be 60 people at this trade show. Um, but we went and put up our booth and, and I say just kind of established some relationships with the Chinese then. Um, I was right, it was a funny situation. The, the British went with a number of people, their government at that time, I think they still do sometimes, uh, subsidized the, the trade mission to China for them. So they had, I think, something like 30 or 35 companies went over there and the first day the show opened, uh, literally nobody showed up. I mean, I, I don't think a hundred people came into the, into the hall. And uh, by evening time, of course, the Brits were just wild with the anger, and their uh, executive director got a hold of the, the man who organized the show, and he said, something's got to happen here. He said, this is just, that was just awful. Nobody here at all. And the man kept saying, tomorrow the, tomorrow the people will come. Don't worry. Tomorrow the people will come. The next day, they let the schools out, and they, and they bust in military people from the military base, turned them loose. We had thousands of people in there punching the machines and breaking and the things going on, taking pictures off the wall. I remember Dan Glosser, one of the manufacturer's reps for the European Park, was sitting in his booth there with the pictures of the rides, I think it was Zero Company. And while they were sitting there talking, people were coming and taking the pictures off the wall and carrying them out. <laughs> Well, it was growing rapidly, uh, both because of growth in the United States and growth in, uh, in other countries. Uh, the development of things like water parks, which hadn't existed for a long time, uh, was another growth opportunity for us. A little later, the family entertainment centers came along. Um, and then, of course, the manufacturing side, manufacturing sales membership of the association was exploding because the, the show was growing as these people from other countries started coming to the show, and it, it became the far and away the preeminent marketplace in the world for the industry. But it wasn't really difficult. It didn't require any concentrated uh, solicitation effort, at least to the extent of sending you know, salesmen out to try to sell membership in the association, because the, the show itself just became something that manufacturers knew they had to come to. Well, the man that hired me was a, was a mentor and a great friend, Truman Woodworth. He said, uh, we'll let you run this association the way you want to until we don't like the way you're doing it, and then we'll throw your ass out. And that, and that's, that's really all the deal I ever had with him. I never, never got into a contract ever. Equal to Truman would be Boo Kindor. Uh, when Boo came into the picture and started uh, urging this internationalization and suggesting to me all kinds of ways and things we should be doing, he became not only a most valued counselor, but a very good friend. The, the big corporations were uh, very reticent about getting involved in the association very extensively. Uh, I understand that Walt Disney, well I know this from a fact talking to Ted Kroll, uh, who was the vice president at Disney, that uh, 
at the outset, uh, Disney wouldn't let his people even come to our meetings. Oh, no, no, he, he said they could come to the meetings, but he didn't want them volunteering for anything. Don't serve in any committees, don't do anything, can't run for office. And that was really true up until very recently. Ted Crow finally got permission. Of course, Walt had been, been long dead, but uh, got permission to put Ted on the board and then into the chairmanship. Uh, but that was the first time Disney got any involvement in it. And uh, the others uh, were somewhat the same way. And I think they were afraid of putting their secrets, their, their uh, uh, special ideas and talents and so on out on public display. I really have difficulty seeing the time when these, uh, the parks that are left fold up and, and we don't have such a thing anymore. Uh, every new uh, invention in the area of entertainment, uh, home entertainment centers and so on, put the fear of God in everybody in the industry. But I've always believed, and I still do, that we are all essentially social creatures. Mm -hmm. And we want to get out and touch the flesh and you know, smell the smoke. <laughs>